In this episode of Think for Christ, we welcome back philosopher J.T. Bridges to talk about his new book, Beyond Origin, a post-Darwinian design theory. In this book, Dr. Bridges provides a much-needed critique of the somewhat stalled debate between neo-Darwinist and intelligent design proponents. The book is full of valuable and probing insights for the ID movement, but by way of disclaimer, it is not by any means an easy read or a beginner-level work. Dr. Bridges is presenting a philosophical critique of the current debate, and in doing so, he surveys ideas from several academic fields, including epistemology, the philosophy of science, and of course, from both neo-Darwinian and intelligent design theory. Likewise, and again, by way of disclaimer, this interview with Dr. Bridges will not be at a beginner level and will at times get us into some technical material and complex ideas. But if you're someone familiar with or interested in the ongoing debate between Darwinism and intelligent design, both this book as well as this interview will be well worth your considered attention. And for those interested, I've included a link to purchase Beyond Origin in the description of this video. Today on Think for Christ, we are once again joined by Dr. J.T. Bridges, who is here to talk about his new book titled Beyond Origin, a Post-Darwinian Design Theory. J.T., welcome back to Think for Christ. Thanks, Anthony, and thanks for having me. Well, since this isn't your uh, first time on the channel, we'll forego introductions and just get right into the content of your book. First of all, congratulations. This is a great work. I really enjoyed reading it this week. Thanks. So why don't you just go ahead and, and take some time here to tell us about the motivation behind the writing of the book. And then if you will, just kind of walk us through your central thesis or, or kind of what you're up to in Beyond Origin. Yeah, there's a, uh, I gave it some thought. I, I was thinking about how to attack this and in terms of an overview. <laughs> and there's really, in to my mind, there's there's really two ways to approach it. There's there's the, uh, the there's the logical analysis, and then there's the sort of autobiographical chronological uh, ways in which these ideas occurred. So, the autobiographical is probably the easiest for me because that's that's how these ideas occurred to me. So it'll keep me, it'll keep things in line there. So, you know, Aristotle says that philosophy begins with wonder, right? So. As we were doing, this is something I try and tell my students. I just recently had an email exchange with a student in my epistemology class, struggling over uh, deciding on a thesis for the research paper. And I, my my advice to him was just let, let's give the class another month or so, right? Just, so get into the research and just see what provokes wonder. What, why is that? Why is that? Right. So, <clears throat> given that philosophy begins with wonder, and and the theses that are most um, important to us are the ones that arise from our own questioning, not the ones that are in, imposed on us by by professors, but but the ones that that emerge from our own questions about the world or about some theory or whatever. So, when I went to Baylor, I, I had two goals. One was to read through the history of Western ideas, because you know, in, in your in your twenties. As uh, I don't know if you guys are out of your twenties yet, uh, but uh, my my quest was was to to th see if I could think of an original idea, if if there's any original analysis out there, and I'd spent enough time around non philosophy family and friends to know that they will often go, oh, you know what I thought of, and then inevitably this is not a new thought. This is something from you know, Spinoza or Hegel or, or Derrida, whoever, right. It's like, no, that's, that's not new and it's wrong, uh, but we don't have time. But anyway, so, so to read through the history of Western ideas and to see if there's any, anything original to, to say, you know, this is, this is sort of the path of uh, professional academia, I suppose. At Baylor, I discovered a real penchant for philosophy of science. Uh, I had always been interested in the natural sciences. Uh, I had to I had to move my little my little medal because my wife was annoyed with it hanging down in the in the screenshot. But I uh, my junior year of high school, I was the advanced chemistry student of the year, and I beat out Carl, who went on to become an, a chemical engineer at Iowa State. So, uh, <laughs> so I have a long standing interest in the natural sciences, 
And so uh, as, as I entered into Baylor's uh, philosophy program and started studying the philosophy of science, it coupled with my uh, interest in Christian apologetics, actually, because Christian apologetics, you know, the uh, understanding the, the defense of the rational, uh, ver the veracity or the rationality of the Christian faith, the philosophy of science, the history and philosophy of science, it really demystifies where science comes from, its nature and limitations, right? Things like that. So that was an emerging uh, subdomain of interest for me, but also uh, along uh, Norman Geisler's lines, I was introduced to the thought of Thomas Aquinas, and this is uh, nothing new to us, but uh, Aquinas's influence on philosophy of religion especially, but then in these more basic fundamental areas of philosophy, metaphysics, epistemology, ethics, right? And so uh, my last semester at Baylor, I was privileged to sit under Eleanor Stump. And uh, her her book on Aquinas had just come out in paperback. Everybody was clamoring for it. And I was able to take a class. She was a visiting professor that semester. And she, I was able to take a class on Aquinas under under Stump. So I met with her in her in her temporary office. And I asked uh, Professor Stump, uh, what was Aquinas's philosophy of science? Because I was trying to sort of meld these two worlds. Very, very nice uh, sweet, gracious response. She goes, well, Aquinas is writing in the 13th century. So he really doesn't have a philosophy of science. And if you ever embarrassed yourself in front of a girl that you like, you'll know the sort of like hot flash of embarrassment that runs through your body when you, when you say or do something just incredibly, incredibly stupid. And so that that was the moment that I had with with Eleanor Stump that will stick out to me from my grad school. You know what what is Aquinas's 13th century philosophy of science? You know, hundreds of years before the rise of, mo of modern science. You know, so you walk out of there going stupid, stupid. Um, <laughs> however, um, that question remained. It, it it stuck with me in that in my in the next sort sort of you know five or six years of going from Baylor to Southern Evangelical in 2008 and, and starting my my doctoral work in the philosophy of religion and really, really understanding at more depth these fundamental areas of Thomistic philosophy of nature, epistemology, metaphysics, theology proper. I, I, I couldn't shake this question of uh, Thomistic epistemology and the philosophy of science. That is, is it possible? Because, uh, you know, as we talk about at SES, um, we don't just think that Thomism is a, a good idea. We think that the categories that he's working with phil are philosophically true. That is, they're true things about the world, and they're only arrived at by philosophical analysis. Now, this is, a, this is an attitude that has largely been abandoned in, uh, in modern contemporary days, but something that we reprise in as yes, it gives us a bit of a, um, a chip on our shoulder maybe, but it also gives us some really interesting things to say, especially in the, uh, in the Anglo American West in philosophy and, and, and specifically among, uh, Christian evangelical scholarship. So as I was ending my, my uh, doctoral studies, uh, I really spent about a year and a half studying the problem of evil, because uh, like I said, I had this enduring apologetics interest in my philosophical research, that is, are there ideas that are uniquely philosophical in nature? That is, the analysis that bears on them is a philosophical analysis. It's not science or it's not theology per se. And then what of those analyses or research projects are of benefit to the Christian mind or are of benefit for the church in how they think about the world that defends the church from insidious onslaught of, of lies and deception and falsehoods, right? So, so that's always sort of like playing in the background of my mind. As I got to the dissertation phase, having studied the philosophy or the uh, problem of evil for a long time, because that, that really is sort of the atheist, that's the tip of the sword for most, most atheists who are, who are, um, intentionally atheological. That is, they're 
they're intentionally trying to dissuade people from a life of faith, right? But, uh, you know, uh, pragmatically, when it came down to writing the dissertation and wanting to just, wanting to just be done, you know how it is. Yeah, you guys have been there. Uh, I had two bodies of research that I had done. I had done some work on philosophy of science and intelligent design and neo-Darwinism, sort of in the intervening years between Baylor and SES. There's about two and a half years there. And I I spent a lot of time, uh, let me back up, with, with this enduring interest in the natural sciences, with a gap in my programs between my MA and my, my PhD, I thought, you know what, most of what I think I know about neo-Darwinism uh, comes from the ID community, right? I'd read Philip Johnson and Behe and Meyer and Dembski and these other guys. Uh, and I thought that's not, that's not charitable. Uh, the right thing to do is to read the Darwinists for themselves, right? Because besides the problem of evil, Darwinism really is this origin mythos for enlightenment rationalism. So if, if you, if you're somebody like, a a Shelley Kagan, right, uh, or or even even a modern atheistic scientist who 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 perhaps has no real axe to grind against religion, but finds themselves sort of either accidentally or mildly atheistic, right? You're still human, right? So you still have these questions of where do we come from? What is the meaning of life? What happens when we die, right? Uh, any so any reflective person. Uh, you know, uh, of sufficient acumen is going to ask these questions about themselves, about their world, right? And so, and and so, the the atheist as as human uh, still still has these questions uh, about. So, and so, Darwinism really plays the the role of the origin mythos for in the Enlightenment rationalist. This this sort of generic Enlightenment rationalist that we're talking. about. And again, as as somebody interested in Christian apologetics, uh, I, I thought, okay, you know, problem of evil for for atheism, but but Darwinism even more fundamental to that. Uh, asking one of the big questions that are that are I, I think un, unavoidable uh, as a reflective human, and that is where do we come from? But then noting in my own research this this paucity of of uh, uh, primary source reading, so I went back to Darwin, read his Origin of Species. I haven't read his whole uh, corpus, but but then um, read some of the uh, uh, some of the main architects of the modern synthesis: Dobzhansky, uh, George Gaylord Simpson, and then from there, you know, uh, a lot of the people that the ID community is having dialogue with. But on the other side, like like a Eugenie Scott, Philip Kitcher, who's a who's a philosopher, um, Elliot Sober, who's a philosopher of biology, right? So just just reading the best and brightest on the other side of the issue. Like we do when we read, you know, Dawkins or a, or a J.L. Mackey or an Anthony Flew to, to understand atheism and reading atheists, uh, William Rowe. So um, having read a bunch of intelligent design material and then going back and reading all the, uh, a lot of primary source uh, material or, or uh, proponents, I would say, of neo-Darwinism. I, I just thought, well, there, there's there's some miscommunication. The, these these are sort of two ships passing each other. They're, there's they're not really on a headlong collision. They're they're talking past one another in certain. So 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 that's 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 the one side of things is the the study of neo Darwinism from the mouths of the neo Darwinists. And one of the things I, I became, and my goal was actually, um, theistic evolution. Like, is neo Darwinism a bona fide, legitimate scientific theory that I have to just like say Big Bang cosmology is, or um, you know, the age of the Earth, or its position in these in the solar system, right? You know, n n nobody thinks that because we move from a, a Ptolemaic to a Copernican model of the solar system that we have to give up our theism, right? We just have to make peace with how revelation uh, from Scripture meets meets uh, fits with revelation from nature. This is the the two books analysis or, or from, from Augustine that, that, uh, the RTB guys preach, uh, consistently. Okay. So, um, so that was my goal is, uh, is to read the Darwinists for themselves to see whether or not this is a scientific theory that I have to make who, whose rigor and analysis is such that I have to make peace with it 
um, in terms of how it comports with my uh, firmly held Christian beliefs. And after probably about two years or so of of this study back and forth, and and keep in mind, while I'm doing this, I'm also deepening my understanding of philosophy and Thomism and, and all this stuff, right? So all of this stuff is sort of happening around me. I still have this enduring question about um, philosophy of science and Thomism, Darwinism and ID, and and um, the the other thing about Thomism that that makes it unique in the Anglo-American West in philosophy is that it's a systematic philosophy. And you guys will understand this, but perhaps your audience won't. But there's a there's a trend toward this uh, loose eclecticism in especially analytic schools of thought, where they they will take uh, so like a Peter Van Inwagen. He you know he's a he's a, a Notre Dame philosopher. He's a pretty well known philosopher of uh, religion. But the the position that he takes on on in Platonism and his metaphysics may have nothing to do with the kind of physicalism that he espouses in his uh, uh, philosophy of mind, right? And none of those may have may come to bear on his re- response to the problem of evil. And just the, this sort of loose eclecticism, where where each philosophical issue is treated uh, almost hermetically sealed off from from the others, uh, just. Uh, personally and now professionally, I find that uh, distasteful, I would say. Um, I gravitate more towards system building uh, as a sort of a, uh, I would think, I think is a natural disposition. But now upon reflection, I think that's the right way to to go uh, as especially not, not just as a philosopher, but especially as a Christian philosopher. Because I think what we want to do is in our philosophical analysis, we want to do the same thing uh, or not the same thing. Uh, we want to do something analogous in our philosophical analysis about the world that we do in our systematic theology about the canon, right? We think that the entire the, the entirety of the canon represents a um, a single whole because it has a one unified author and that is God. Ultimately, although it's written through human agencies that it's not going to say something contradictory or false within its scope because it has ultimately one author and that author is divine, right? So uh, going back to the two books, if we think the same thing about nature, that God is the author of both scripture and of nature, then then God as the author is the ultimate ground of the unity of the being of things, right? And if we have a true philosophical system, systematic analysis of the real, um, it will give us uh, a depth of category and analysis that will abut and support, like the the like the uh, uh, the the medieval adage that the philosophy is the handmaiden to theology. And so a but but um, so a systematic philosophical uh, a, 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 a deep philosophical system can support a systematic theology uh i think in a in a better more consistent way both both intrinsically and methodologically um a, a, a uh, our systematic philosophy can support a systematic theology so so we have this nice coherent christian worldview all the way down to the principles of being and logic and knowledge and goodness all the way up through uh, natural, uh, uh, natural law, uh, virtues, the uh, divine command, all, all, all the way up to our ethics, all the way down to how do you treat your server at IHOP, right? So, so from the most abstract philosophical theology, all the way down to, um, and perhaps it's becoming egregious these days, uh, how much I tip my server, but, um, but without, um, without any, uh, significant gaps in continuity, right? That's, that's the goal. However, we plug those gaps is uh, is uh, debatable. Uh, if it weren't debatable, we you know we wouldn't have jobs. So uh, so that, that's what that's what we do. We, do, we debate these things. Um, now, now I've gotten so far out on limb. I'm, I'm trying to walk my way back to where my uh, jumping off point was. Um, oh, systems building. Okay, so so in the in the in the uh, uh, intertestamental period of my <laughs> of my graduate and doctoral work, I was reading Darwinism and ID. And then in my doctoral work, I was reading predominantly Problem of Evil. And then when it came down to getting the dissertation done, I thought, um, 
Oh, uh, and in that time, I started teaching full time at SES, and my full. Uh, I, so bef- as I was finishing my, you know, my my languages and my and my oral exams, they offered me a full time teaching position for uh, for undergrads and grads. So. Um, one of the first classes I taught was philosophy of science. So I, I had to teach a slate of three classes. Then I got to pick an elective and I picked philosophy of science because I wanted to return to some of that literature. <clears throat> so what I realized in reading the philosophy of science is that, um, is that one of the main issues now, I, now I had seen these dichotomies emerge in more general areas of philosophy, the realism, nominalism debate in metaphysics, right? The, the A theory, B theory of time, more specifically in metaphysics also. Um, philosophy of mind, you know, materialism, substance dualism, uh, epistemology, um, uh, coherentism, uh, foundationalism, or internalism, externalism, right? So in, you know, in the, in the landscape of contemporary analytic philosophy, there's, there's all these dichotomies that sort of emerge. And philosophy of science was no different. You have this realism, anti-realism dichotomy in the philosophy of science now, uh, for the for the uninitiated, the the realism anti realism debate in the philosophy of science is is a debate about the the nature of scientific theories specifically. It's not a it's not a debate about reality in general. So it's not it's not the kind of anti realism that you might find in a metaphysics book like the uh, the the Lux text. But it's specifically oriented toward scientific theories. Well, what did what is this theory and what does it tell me about the world so kind of three pillars of scientific realism in the philosophy of science is that our our mature scientific theories are they tell us about the world right what they say about the world is true and the language that they use to say those things is literally true is is to be taken literally rather than just you know metaphor so those are those are kind of the three staples of uh, of what make up a sort of a robust realism in the philosophy of science about scientific theories, and then atheists, uh, not atheists, anti-realists, a uh, little Freudian slip there. Anti-realists will deny some of those, right? They'll they'll either deny that our our scientific theories are about reality, they'll deny that they're re- literally true, or and or they'll deny that. The language that we use in those theories should be literal. It should be more metaphor, or like Larry Loudon will talk about science as a as a puzzle solving endeavor. You know, one generation of scientists does solves its puzzles and it leaves other puzzles undone, and then the next generation comes in and and solves those puzzles, and less than until there's a paradigm shift, and then we start over with new puzzles, and then we just solve those. But the but for somebody who's an anti-realist, like a, a Larry Loudon or a Boss Van Frossen, it is not the aim of science to get at some deep metaphysical truth about the world. This is sort of a, I think, sort of a hangover from the logical positivism of the of the early mid twentieth uh, century. Um, so that, so those are those are kind of the broad pieces of the puzzle, right? Um, the the talking past one another of the Darwinists and the intelligent design guys. The lingering question from grad school about could you take a 13th century philosopher like Aquinas and make a philosophy of science for the 21st century out of his principles? And then in the philosophy of science proper, this is there a solution to this 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 ranging dichotomy between realism and anti-realism? So so any good any good solution is going to be solution to a well-stated problem. And so those are the, those are the elements. And so then, so then in the backdrop of all this is this, um, is desire, is this desire for a systematic view of the world, a systematic view of the world that comports with the, the um, philosophical truths that I believe I learned and the, and the theological truths that, that come by way of, uh, of uh, both revelations, natural and uh, special. So given, given that, given these sort of sets of problems in this, this desire, really the, the systematization was the main motivator. And, And this is why. So when you are desirous of systems building, right? 
but you're reading in all these diverse areas, right? Uh, Neo-Darwinism ID, uh, Thomistic philosophy, philosophy of science. You're sort of, you're, you're discovering things that you think are true, right? Uh, so the, in the, you know, the Neo-Darwin, yeah, microevolution is true. Like the, the finch beaks, um, the, uh, the way in which bacteria develop, uh, resistance to antibodies, right? Uh, these things are, these things are true. And then this, this range of complexity from, from, uh, less complex to more complex life across the fossil record, the, the seemingly homologous, uh, comparative anatomy between species, right? There are, there are things that Darwinism is set to explain. So I, I bring these things up in, in, in classes where students have just said, well, there's no evidence for Neo-Darwinism. No, there, there's, there are evidences from, from natural history that Darwinism is set to explain. And he, he explained it better than William Paley did in William Paley's natural theology. William Paley thought that the earth was about 6,000 years old and that every species was specially created for its specific environment with, uh, immutably. Right. What Darwin introduces is this mutability of species. No, species change. There's this, there's this dynamism of species, right? There, there's this dynamism uh, uh, of species with their environment. As their environment changes, they, there's these adaptations that, that take place, right? So, um, so you, you're reading that, and then you read the ID guys, uh, and they go, they go, well, that that's all well and good, but look at the look at the informational content of life. I mean, Darwin's writing in the, you know, 1860s or whatever. And biology is is adept at these sort of uh, macro level qualitative statements, but look at this quantitative analysis. So this is this is Dembski's design inference. This is Meyer in in um signature in the cell. This probabilistic resources and uh, against this crass uh bald-faced materialistic view of uh the, the genome and and its uh, information content. You go, yeah, I think that's true too. Um, you, you then you read the the anyway in, in all these different areas, you, you're sort of uh, think of a a big you know a big cork board, and you're just putting pins in these different places where you go, yeah, I think what Aquinas says about the nature of man and his knowing is right, and I think uh, you know I, I I think Thomas Kuhn has a good point about. Um, about the nature of uh, paradigm changes throughout the history of science. And I think the ID guys have something to say and the Darwin stuff. Something. So in all of these things, you're just sort of putting pins in places where you think someone has said something true. Now the SIFS, the systems building, uh, attempt comes in to say, how is, how is all of this true? All of these things that I think are true, all of these different, you know, points and sub points, in epistemology and what, you know, how is all, and, um, th that's, that's really the, the difficulty of, of the systems building, uh, approach we, but, um, but that's, that's sort of the task that I, that I took on in writing the dissertation. I thought, you know what, uh, you know, the, uh, air traffic controllers have this phrase called pushing tin where you've got, you've got planes that are at different altitudes and at different speeds. And what you're trying to do is change all of those so you can line them up on the runway and get them in you know so that was that was sort of the task was to see if i could push 10 to to get all these things lined up but in a, in a more in a more uh, uh philosophical way uh, aquinas says it belongs to the wise man to to order things well to bring order to things you know okay well i think all these things are true but but can they all be true simultaneously without contradiction right So that's the, I guess that's the autobiographical chronological sort of approach to the backdrop of, of why I wrote the dissertation that I wrote. Um, I, I guess we can pause for me to take a drink of coffee and you guys to interject anything if you, if you would. For sure. Yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah. So at this point, um, why don't we just get into, if you can just unpack for us, um, what you would consider itself. the main thesis of your yeah. book. Okay. So, so now let's go back to uh, study the philosophy of science and the realism, anti-realism debate. Okay. 
what I what I started noticing is that um, you know Richard Boyd, who's a strong realist philosopher of science, uh, uh, a realist in the philosophy of science, um, he will in in places follow W. B. O'Quine in his epistemology. You have Karl Popper who will uh, uh, give a nod to David Hume in certain moods. Uh, Nancy Cartwright who will say, "I'm Kantian." You know, this is a. Uh, and so what I what I started noticing is that. Um, the realism or the philosophy of science itself is a subset of epistemological commitments. And then I ran across an, across an article uh, by a guy named uh, Massimo Pigliucci. Pigliucci is a, is a uh, contributing editor to, uh, to this book, but Pigliucci in, in a, I think it was a blog post originally talked about um, this correction to Neil deGrasse Tyson. And one of the things he one of the things Pigliucci says in there, and I, I was like, oh, okay, he agrees with me, uh, or I agree with him, uh, is that the philosophy, of, uh, the philosophy of science, among other things, is a subset of epistemology. And that's exactly where I came, because I thought the way I um, went about it was I thought, well, science, whatever else it is, you know, sociologically or psychologically, whatever, whatever else it is, it's a way of knowing right? Science is a way of knowing the world. Well, if it's a way of knowing, if it's a way of human knowing, then that makes it a species of, or a subset of epistemology, which is the theory of human knowing, right? So that was, that was a, an important discovery that, um, uh, and, and then you have, uh, guys like, uh, Mark Lang, Drew, uh, guys like Mark Lang, who, who, uh, who wrote an article called would direct realism solve the classical problem of induction. Right. And Lang is, uh, a, a, an incredible philosopher, philosopher of science. And he says, yeah. Um, and he gives, he gives, um, he gives examples from, uh, early, um, uh, like 1920s astronomy. I think, uh, very, ver uh, stars with, uh, 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 variable luminosity or something like that. And then he says, yeah. Um, from this sort of historical analysis, he goes, yeah, some version of direct realism would, would solve this sort of problem of induction. And I go, yeah, he stops right at the edge of offering what that direct realism would be. Well, Aquinas's epistemology, among other things, is considered a version of direct realism. For those who embrace it or those who, who deny it, it, it's considered some form of direct realism. So that was a that was a starting point. It was to realize that the philosophy of science is a subset of epistemology, and so that gave me that gave me a, a, an initial starting point to say how can you bring Thomas's 13th century philosophy into a 21st century philosophy of science? Well, the first thing to note is you start with his epistemology. So I've been heavily in influenced by um, Etienne Gilson and Jacques Maritain in their understanding of Aquinas's epistemological principles. Uh, two important works, uh, Gilson's um, Methodical Realism and uh, Maritain's uh, The Degrees of Knowledge. So so, so in, that was the first step, is to say, how can we take uh, basically Gilson and Maritain and build from their principles a, a philosophy of science? And so where I started in that was with John Worrell's epistemic structural realism, because I'd been, I'd been steeped in this Aristotelian Thomistic philosophy of nature, whereby we understand something's uh, the, the substance of thing, something through its accidents, right? Because the, the substantial form doesn't present itself. What presents itself is a series of unique accidents that make this an apple and that an orange, right? And so via, via this collection of accidents, we, we, perceive the substance as a, as a unifying, uh, principle. Right. So, so in, in reading John Worrell, his, uh, 1988, uh, article, the best, uh, structural realism, the best of both worlds, Worrell tries to steer a middle ground between strong realism and, and keep in mind, strong realism is so strong that it would deny the, the genuineness of scientific revolutions in the history of science. They would deny that they they would try and maintain some thread of continuity even over radical theory change like ether and, and things like that right so 
Worrell doesn't want to go that far he, he, because he realizes that the um, that theory change, uh, genuine revolutions in in science in in the history of science, um, uh, are they're genuine, uh, and so but they also lend themselves to what's called the uh, pessimistic meta induction. Um, that is, um, if, if something is if something as robust as uh, Newtonian physics that dominated for 230 years or whatever can be overthrown. What, what right do we have to put faith in Einsteinian physics right now, however long it lasts, maybe it lasts 450 years, but eventually there's going to be something post Einsteinian, right? So it, um, so we're all understands that there is a, that, that recognizing that there have been genuine revolutions in the history of science lends itself to an anti-realism about mature scientific theories. So he's trying to he's trying to steer a middle ground between those two. And his structural realism is this, specifically re with regard to quantum mechanics. His structural realism is that when it comes to quantum phenomena, we don't know the natures of these things. But what we do know via our precise experimentation is the mathematical structure of the phenomena. So we can have a thread of realism about the phenomena that doesn't make us anti-realists, right? We think that that structure is true, even if it doesn't give us the robust nature of these things. So that, um, so that was the that was the starting point for, and, and what I what I argued in my in my dissertation, and, and then now in the book, is that what Warall offers the reader uh, in his structural realism as a way of. Um, uh, ameliorating both of these extremes of realism and anti-realism actually emerges quite naturally on this substance accidents, Aristotelian Thomistic philosophy of nature, because what war all unbeknownst to him is pointing out is that when it comes to things like quantum phenomena, what we understand are, are the, uh, are the precise quantifiable uh, accidents of these things for whom their nature is still obscure or mysterious, right? Which explains why we can be so good at uh, prediction and quantum phenomena, but then be baffled by a um, how to imagine the phys a physical system with these properties, action at a distance or non-locality, things like that, right? Um, so that was the that was the starting point because I, I thought you know what if. Uh, Increasing, well, at least when I was doing the research, um, the philosophy of science just was the philosophy of physics. You had to make sense of the history of physics, the nature of physics, quantum mechanics, right? So most of the philosophy of science was just the discussion of the philosophy of physics. And I thought, well, if you can't make Aquinas bear on quantum mechanics, then you, you're not even part of the conversation. So I thought we're all, so I, I offer what I call a Thomistic structural realism where you get to Warhol's conclusion, but as a natural extension of these, uh, in a very, very consistent, I, I think, clean way, you get to Warhol's conclusions, but via this kind of direct realism that Lang alluded to. And so uh, what emerges is this, is this structural realism that is motivated by Aristotelian Thomistic epistemological commitments, right? So, so that's where, that's where that analysis started. But, but then you start to look at, uh, Maritain's degrees of knowledge and things like that. And, um, and you note that in Gilson's methodical realism, he'll say things like, um, uh, knowledge is not just one thing, right? There, so, so he'll, he'll critique, uh, Descartes, who's arguably the father of uh, modern philosophy. He'll critique Descartes in his epistemological uh, modernity to say it's not a discourse on method as if uh as if the human mind is is just one thing or the human oh, sorry the human knowing is just one thing there are different knowledges because what human knowing is is an accord between the knower and the thing known according to the mode of being of the knower and according to how uh, the, the how uh, 
what level of sensible access we have to the thing known. So for example, when we do our theology proper, when we talk about God, God is pure spirit, right? God is not, you know, a physical, physical object. And so how does a, an embodied soul, right? The embodiment is the senses, the five senses. The soul is the, is the, the ability for abstract intellection functioning simultaneously in the human knower. But our classical empiricism is that human knowing starts with the senses. And so if something is completely nonsensible, it's completely immaterial, it's pure spirit like God, then how do we know? And, and one of the things that Aquinas will say is that we know God by his effects, right? So when, when, we, when we affirm that God is wise, we know that the, the reason we affirm that God is wise is because the effect of wisdom is orderliness, and we see orderliness in nature, right? So from the effect of the, the well-orderedness of nature, we affirm that God is wise in the cause, right? So um, I just, just lost the thread of, uh, of where I was going with this. Well, maybe I can interject here. So what yeah, you're yeah. explaining here is one of the things you do in the book is you try to um, develop a realist epistemology, or you rather, uh, you attempt to apply a Thomistic yeah. realist epistemology to a philosophy of science, Yeah, which is for the viewers, this is one of the things that Dr. Bridges does in this book. Um, and I think you do it really well. And, and I think your incense, in, insights are, are great. But if, if we could, I know that Andrew has some questions for you. But before we get to that, maybe um, right in chapter one, you do a mm -hmm. critique of the um, approach that a lot of intelligent design advocates make in the debate with neo-Darwinists. And you critique the wedge strategy. Mm -hmm. And you talk about the difference between metaphysical commitments and then larger scientific paradigms. Yeah. So if I'm if I'm not mistaken, that seems to me to be the very heart of what you're trying to do um, is to get us to think differently um, on how to critique the uh, neo-Darwinian paradigm. Really. So it, yeah. can you just can you talk about the wedge approach and how yeah. your view in this book differs from that? Yeah. Let me let me do that backwards. Uh, Anthony, because your your question prompted me to, to to pick up the thread that I that I'd left on, and it goes back to this methodical realism that different objects lend themselves to human knowing because of their different natures and their different accesses. Right. So, in J.P. Moreland's Christianity and the Nature of Science, right, th this is one of those uh, little pins in the board. He says. I don't think we should be realist or anti-realist wholesale. We should be realist or anti-realist on, on a case-by-case -case basis. Chairs getting old. Hopefully that's the only thing in this office that's breaking down. Um, so I thought, yeah, I think that's true. Uh, Moreland is, is just sort of baldly affirming, why don't we just look at each scientific theory on a case-by-case -case basis rather than saying, with science, I'm a realist, or with science, I'm an anti-realist. Because... We have different objects. I mean, why would my scientific, why would my uh, view of the nature of scientific theories be the same for quantum mechanics as it is trees and dogs, botany or zoology, when those objects are radically different, and my my inductive and and uh, sensorial access to those things is completely different. So this laid the groundwork for a a uh, an eclectic view of the philosophy of science, where on a case-by-case -case basis, we evaluate theories based on these principles of human knowing, right? A philosophy of science that emerges from, uh, uh, emerges in a principled way from how humans know things, science being a particular instance of, uh, or a particular uh, method for knowing these things. And then, and then that judgment of realism or anti-realism changing as the object changes or our access to it. What about things that are that are super far back in time or really far away or really small or move really fast, right? It just gives us the, this kind of flexible um, theoretical approach. To so, so having done that, you go, well, then where is Darwinism on this realism, anti-realism continuum? Well, what I said was that when it comes to 
things like uh, quantum phenomena. We can be structural realists because of the precise, something like eight or nine places past the decimal point in precision with this phenomena. So we understand with, with extreme precision the, the, uh, the technical structure of the phenomena, even if we don't know what these things are necessarily in terms of like a nature. That's also true. I uh, remember in my in my dissertation defense uh, name drop. Uh, 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 um, Jay Richards asked me about like, well, what about like the nucleogenesis of stars? Things that happened back in time. That I said, no, no, that that's fine. We can be realists, some stripe of realists with regard to that, because it because those things are also known with some level of quantifiable mathematical rigor. But when it comes to the objects of natural history, this is where. This is where having a very clear philosophy of science gives us ground for looking at the intelligent design neo-Darwinism debate. Because Dembski said, uh, William Dembski said in one of his talks back in like 2011, 2012, he says, this is really a debate between two different paradigms. I go, okay, well, what is the discipline that looks at scientific paradigms as paradigms? Science, the scientists don't. It's the philosophy of science that deals with scientific paradigms as paradigms and philosophy of science is a subset of our epistemology. Okay. So, so as we start looking at the objects of neo-Darwinism, you go, they're macro level objects. They're like dinosaurs and woolly mammoths and uh, Neanderthals, right? These sorts of things. They're not, they're not known with precise quantification, right? And if you, uh, if you remember the uh, the documentary Expelled uh, with uh, Ben Stein was the kind of the MC going along. There's this uh, <laughs> there's this great interview with David Berlinski. Berlinski is just such a uh, a great guy to listen to. Just the the unvarnished arrogance of the man is, is actually endearing to me to watch this guy just like eh, you know demure from things that are that are widely held beliefs. Anyway, so uh, Berlinski says that. Um, when he's talking about evolutionary biology or uh, this evolutionary macro evolutionary theory of, of natural history, he says it lacks the rigor of mathematical physics and mathematical physics lacks all the rigor of pure mathematics. So you have what you have is this descending degree of intelligibility where by the time you with, with evolutionary biology in the very bottom, he goes, by the time you get down there, you go, this thing is just unclear. And then if you see him in debates with like, uh, there's a panel debate on the uh, firing line. Uh, and he was, uh, he was asking Eugenie Scott, how many mutations does it take to turn a cow into a whale? Right. He's just looking at the, the fossil record. Is it 20,000? Is it 50,000? Like there is. So, so what you start to see about neo-Darwinism is that you have these incomplete macro level non-mathematical qualitative judgments and where Maritan in his degrees of knowledge, this is why he says conclusions in biology and psychology are much more philosophical or logical than they are mathematical. So we have these two modes of deduction. We have mathematics and we have logic. And, and as the, as the mathematics of Darwinism just trails away into nothing, it becomes much more logical than it is mathematical. And so the deductions that they make and the way they string their narrative together um, is open to the, uh, the the sort of assumptions that go into it. So this goes back to your uh, your tee off question, Anthony, and that is what's wrong with the with the wedge structure? <clears throat> the 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 wedge approach for um, for Philip Johnson in his book The Wedge of Truth. Uh, Philip Johnson was one of the founders co founders of the Discovery Institute and. Uh, a uh, long-standing sort of, I, I would say probably grandfather of the contemporary intelligence design movement. And in his, uh, to the 2000-2001, The Wedge of Truth, he's responding to uh, Ken Miller, who was a biologist at Brown University. And what Johnson says there is he says that uh, people like Miller will ask us to give an alternative to neo-Darwinism. Um, and he says, Darwinism is built on materialist grounds. And that's probably the best that we can do on materialist ground. Evolution is probably, D Darwinian evolution is probably the best we can build on materialist grounds. It's the materialism that's a, that's the mistake. And so 
with this with this new philosophical sort of uh, uh, framework in place, I started to look at that and I thought there are this is not the way scientists think about their science, right? This is why Thomas Kuhn will will talk about in his uh, structure of scientific revolutions. He'll talk about a paradigm will persist until certain anomalies emerge. And those anomalies continue to build until a significant minority in that in the in that scientific community will begin to adjust certain uh, more or less proximate assumptions about the paradigm until there's a scientific overthrow. And it's this gestalt shift where they're like, no, 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 it's not, uh, it's a relativity. It's not absolute motion in time. It's relative motion in time, right? Which shifts the way we see the same phenomena. Um, and so looking at scientists as human knowers, right? You go, the scientists are not primarily trying to defend atheism necessarily. They're trying to interpret their data and they're trying to do research and, and they find anomalies and they try and give those, they give an account of those, right? And then what, um, what determines how they, how they interpret that data are what, uh, you know, I, <laughs> I remember having a conversation, you know, I, I sort of stumbled into these things that I found out later. People, people already have phrases for, I remember having a conversation with Frank Turek at the old uh, Tilly Morris campus. And I was, I was, I was still muddling through some of this research and these, these ideas. And I said, uh, I said, you know, there, there are certain assumptions that drive the way Darwinists um, derive their conclusions. And Frank, you know, with his New Jersey accent, he's like, yeah, metaphysics. I go, well, it's not, it's not metaphysics per se, because it doesn't, it doesn't rise to the level of what we think fundamental reality is, right? It's something more proximate to say natural history and the way we look at objects of natural history, which I were to later find out, um, in the, uh, Rutledge, uh, companion to the philosophy of science. Um, these things are called relativized a priori assumptions, mm -hmm. right? So, so, um, uh, Kuhn Kuhn will say about this revolution from Newtonian physics to Einsteinian physics that our fundamental notions of space and time underwent a radical conversion, right? So this fundamental, no these fundamental notions that change, that then change the way the data, the, the particular data set is um, uh, uh, interpreted. And so as I was looking at the wedge approach where Phil Johnson just goes, well, Darwinism is probably the best we can do on materialist grounds. It's, it's the materialism that's wrong. I thought, no, that's, that's, that's not the right analysis. And the, and the, and the evidence for that is this, you have, on the one hand, you have Philip, uh, Francis Collins, uh, head of the, um, NIH, uh, the, uh, uh human genome project. Right. So, uh, uh, you know, a microbiologist or a biochemist or a uh, geneticist or uh, uh, probably the latter. So Francis Collins is a is a theist. He's a Catholic. Right. And he's full blown Darwinian. Like he thinks that the evidence is best interpreted a law along a um, Darwinian line. Richard Dawkins, well known atheist and materialist, also thinks that the same evidence should be interpreted in the same exact way. These are radically different fundamental metaphysical grounds, theism and atheism, right? Or theism and materialism. And I thought Johnson's Johnson's uh, analysis is flawed because you can change, you, you could take a Richard Dawkins and send him to a charismatic revival and he gets baptized in the Holy Ghost, whatever, and he comes back a theistic evolutionist. He doesn't come back an ID proponent necessarily, Right. He just converts his materialism to theism and then keeps interpreting natural history along Darwinian lines. So, um, so that was the, that was the, that was the, an indicator that there was a problem with the intelligence design approach to neo-Darwinism. It does. So there, there are, there are people in the, in the ID movement, uh, you know, Michael Denton and Philip Johnson and, uh, that will recognize that there's the, that, that, uh, for example, Thomas Kuhn's contribution to the philosophy, but then they'll ignore applying that to the debate, 
in favor of just sort of a a rigorous analysis of the science. Uh, now, uh, I want to say this about the the ID guys because I consider myself some stripe of intelligence design proponent, but not in the way that they they've built the rhetoric of, up over the last uh, you know 20, 30, 40 years. But the, the analogy that I have is that I, I live in the in the in the North Midwest, and uh, and you know there are times where we have significant amounts of snowfall, and that's when you love the snowplow guys because they're out there at you know three four in the morning they're clearing the streets. And I was I was coming back home from the gym early one morning, and there were three snowplows like just plowing in front of me, and I thought, okay, I'll, I'll drive fifty miles an hour to not have to drive through you know a foot of snow or whatever, and. I thought that's that's probably the good that's probably a good uh, analogy for how I think about intelligence design as it was built in the nineteen nineties and the early two thousands. I disagree with some of the things that they said. I disagree with some of the rhetorical strategies, but I think they they cleared a lot of ground. They they built a lot of um, uh, the, they built a lot of uh, a good of a framework for they they, they set they teed up a lot of discussions that would have would have otherwise not happened and so so i i appreciate their contribution there but just because we're we are um be uh, beholden to some of the historical elements of this doesn't mean we shouldn't uh, continue our analysis in, in the direction of truth so um yeah so that's where that's where the the my my i started to break with the ID approach to arguing against neo Darwinism, and I actually had a moment of uh, I, I had I had a, you know I had my own eureka moment, and it was this: I was reading an article by Richard Boyd, and Boyd is arguing against Boss Van Frossen's constructivism. Uh, constructivism is a, a, a version of anti realism, and so Boyd. Boyd says something that I found extremely helpful and clarifying, and it was this. He says, and remember, Boyd's a realist, like a hard realist, like denying the legitimacy of scientific revolutions in the history of science realists. At least he was back in the 90s. And he says about Van Frossen, and these guys are global. He's a global realist with regard to the sciences, and and Van Frossen is a global anti-realist. There's no eclecticism in sight at this stage. So Boyd says about Van Frossen, he goes, uh, because Van Frossen's view is that um, science's aim is not metaphysical truth. It's not the truth of the way the world is. It's uh, the structure, the theoretical structure largely arises in the mind of the scientist. And then it's imposed on the data set. And the, the, and the way in which it's imposed actually orients the data in a way that ma makes the data intelligible for the scientist, right? And Boyd says, no, 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 that cannot possibly be how science proceeds. Because if that were true, then in the history of, say, astronomy, we wouldn't have had anomalies that push back against the paradigm, which we have, which has caused revolutionary overthrow, right? So um, so we wouldn't have seen significant shifts in the, in the history of science if anomalies weren't able to push back against their uh, prevailing paradigm. And, and the light bulb moment was, was this. I thought, yeah, that's exactly one of the criticisms of neo-Darwinism is that you have these anomalies. You have the, you, you, in Behe's, in, in all the ID guys literature, in Behe's work on uh, Darwin's black box, the, the way in which the um, natural selection as a mechanism isn't able to account for these complex systems and their interconnectivity, if one part breaks, the whole thing breaks. How could that be passed down, you know, uh, genealogically? You have the informational analysis of uh, the origin of life. You have the Cambrian explosion and things like convergent evolution, which seems like a pretty ad hoc hypothesis for saving the uh, the theory, right? So you've got all these things that are, I, I would consider, significant anomalies toward, for a fairly orthodox reading of uh, neo-Darwinism, and yet neo-Darwinism just keeps, I mean, Michael Denton's evolution of theory and crisis is almost 40 years old, and yet neo-Darwinism is still the dominant paradigm. So if Kuhn is right, so, okay, I'm just putting all these pieces together. If Kuhn is right in that 
the way paradigms are overthrown is that these anomalies uh, emerge, right? And then those anomalies require a different theoretical set. That theoretical, so uh, scientists abandon that uh, the original theory in favor of a different theory that explains the aspects of the first theory, but also some of the anomalies. Okay. Now, with this eclecticism in place, we already said, you know, given this, given this commitment to realism, right? These medium-sized objects in natural history has these medium-sized objects separated from one another by significant amounts of geologic time. Millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of years. We have this more sort of narrative logical approach rather than a rigorous mathematical approach to the, to the different objects, each of which individually are, are fragmented sometimes and incomplete. Does that lend itself toward a realist view of those objects? or more of an anti-realist view. So just in in sort of a, a general epistemological way, given this eclecticism, you go, yeah, I, I should not be a realist regarding natural history in the same way I am with, say, botany or marine biology. You know, people who study whales, <laughs> you know, it's like, well, how, how can you believe in whales? It, th that's a whale right there in front of you. Um, so... Given given that our our uh, classical empiricism and our, and our epistemological principles in, in in the context of this eclecticism lend itself to looking at the theory of neo Darwinism more as an anti real anti realistically the question becomes what kind of anti realism and Boyd's commentary about um, Van Frossen or tipped me off that probably the best way of understanding neo Darwinism is as this sort of Van Frossian construct where it's the assumptions that exist in the mind of the scientists that impose themselves on the data set and organize it and give it an intelligibility in order to draw its conclusions. And so the analogy, and in talking about the central thesis, it's this. People that affirm Darwinism, for, for as long as I've read the literature, people that affirm Darwinism believe it's literally true. People that oppose Darwinism are trying to prove that it's false. These are both realists' approaches to the theory. And my, I think, philosophical analysis and discovery is this. The theory is not realist. The theory has all the hallmarks of a constructivism. Not all science, but this particular science does, by virtue of what humans are as knowers and what the objects are that the, that the science has to deal with. It's not Darwinism's fault that the, the natural history is so uh, poor, you know, that, that we have fragmented evidence spread out over hundreds of millions of years. And we're trying to tell a, a single coherent narrative about all of life on earth. That's a, that's a pretty hefty task. And Darwinism is a heroic attempt to address that. But this answers the question, I think, somewhat dispassionately of, of how is Darwinism different from, say, chemistry or marine biology or botany? I'm not saying Darwinism isn't a legitimate scientific theory. I'm saying among scientific theories, it's different. And I'm trying to account for what is it that makes it different. Now, having said all that, if this is true, if this is true that neo-Darwinism should be understood as an anti-realist construct, right? And the evidence for that is the way in which, you know, every new significant evidences don't over, they just redraw the tree of life. Oh, there's a new branch there. Oh, okay. It's not predictive. It's sort of reactive. One of the, one of the interesting discoveries is if you go back and read, um, uh, I think it's 71, 72, punctuated equilibrium, uh, Gould and Eldridge. Just read the abstract from that submission. In the abstract, uh, Gould and Eldridge say that, that paleontology has labored under the, under the unjustified assumption of gradualism since its inception from Darwin, right? They go, but if we give up the assumption of gradualism in favor of more of a sudden emergence, a punctuational view, suddenly natural history looks different. And, and uh, Gould says this in his uh, Structure of Evolutionary Theory, which is this huge tome that should have been edited down and was not. Um, 
he says stasis is data like these things that pop into the fossil record without uh intelligible precursors and then they 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 exist for millions of years and they pop he goes that's data we have to account for that and so he he gives more of a punctuational account but but that's all part of the history of science the analysis is this why is it why is it that not based on some new discovery but based on a change at the level of the assumptions Gould and Eldridge create a different view of paleontological sciences. It's because as a construct, those relativized a priori are the way in which the, the science establishes the, uh, the intelligibility parameters for the data. Now, th my, my analogy that is, is this, that I go back to over and over again, because I think it works and I'm not creative enough to have a, another a secondary analogy is this the constellations, right? If you were to go to say, uh, some tribe in, uh, in the Philippines that, you know, and you look up at, I, I'm not sure what the, uh, what the constellations look like from that vantage on earth. I'm not very well traveled, but if you were to look up and say, see the, the big dipper and you go, you go, oh, hey, look, it's the Big Dipper. And they go, no, 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 no. That's the, that's the plow. Right? Um, are either one of those true? And why would you argue about that? Right? The constellations are just a way that we impose order on the night sky so that we, so that it obtains a kind of intelligibility to us. Right? Otherwise, uh, I've heard it said that that we you you have about between between three and six thousand individual points of light that are discernible by the naked eye. If you were to look up into a clear night sky, um, the way that we have a conversation about those individual points is we say, "There's Orion, there's the Bear, there's the Big Dipper," right? We but but if you look at the the like the stars in Orion's belt. Um, I, I looked this up years ago, uh, astronomically there, some of them are, are really bright, but further, like 400,000 light years further away, but they appear to be all lined up because of our platform on the surface of the earth. They all appear in a line and we go, well, that's Orion's belt. That's what we're doing that, or I, I would say that's what neo-Darwinism does. And, and not only, not just neo-Darwinism, but any theory dealing with the objects of natural history, that's what it does when it looks down into the earth. We have these fragmented disparate fossils that are, uh, they, they look similar to one another in terms of comparative anatomy. And so we develop a theory to make sense of what would otherwise be an unintelligible data set. That theory is largely assumption driven and logically derived and narratively it, it's narrative. We tell stories about what happened over history, right? And so, um, the consequences of that analysis is that you go, well, then the way to develop a new paradigm, a post Darwinian theory, right, is not to um, explore paleontological sciences for more evidence. It's to, because if, if this is a construct, then the way to cause a scientific revolution is to simply change out the way in which the, the, the assumptions that frame the theory. So similarly, Paley, William Paley thought about, thought that species were relatively new immutable for their location. And Darwin said there, the earth is at least three uh, working from uh, Charles Lyell's time. The, the earth is at least 300 million years old species um, are mutable. Right. And they change according to environmental changes, right? This gradualism, gradual changes over geologic time can lead up to large changes. That was Lyell's assumption about geology. So like a river running through a, 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 a valley can produce a Canyon. We don't need to have a catastrophism that it, that explains how the canyon came about. It, just something gradual. The gradual erosion of a river running through a valley over 300 million years can create a canyon. And Darwin thought, okay, analogously, the sort of 
slight changes that we see in nature built up over hundreds of millions of years can cause large changes at the at the level of of species right so so darwin just changes out and actually uh meyer says this in his signature and cell he says darwin among other things in his origin of species um introduced a new framework for understanding the history of life and so what i'm saying is that the what Darwin did all at once in his origin of species with regard to Paley has been happening to Darwinism spread out over the last 40 or 50 years. You have punctuated equilibrium that, that disagrees with the, 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 the rate and tempo. You have uh, cladistics that takes a non genealogical view of the fossil record. And now you have, um, you have challenges to the tree of life hypothesis, right? So if you see, so if you, if you replace these fundamental assumptions with something different, if, uh, if instead of having a single origin, you have, and I just got this new book um, by uh, Nick Lane. So I'm I'm trying to I'm trying to bone up on on some of the uh, uh, books that have come out in the intervening years, and one of the things that that Lane says, eighty six. Oh, okay. Yeah, eighty six. Oh. Uh, I will argue that natural proton gradients drove the origin of life on Earth. Da, da, da. Um, so uh, Lane has this idea that uh, there are things at the level of physics and chemistry that drive the emergence of complex life at the level of single-celled organisms. Those organisms start to end, end, uh, enter into a symbiotic relationship. For example, one bacterial cell engulfs another bacterial cell, which is how they think uh, sort of the, the mitochondria uh, became you know, one of the first organelles. Um, and then he says, uh, evolution should tend to play out along similar lines, guided by similar constraints elsewhere in the universe. And you go, okay, well, fundamental to this, this naturalistic chemical view of the origin of life. And this is, this is where I got my, uh, primary inspiration was this, uh, this uh, journal, uh, technical, uh, the, the genomic potential hypothesis by Christian Schwab, a chemist's view of the origins, evolution, and unfolding of life. This is from like 2005. Uh, at the time, cost me an arm and a leg because it was just a volume in a series. Um, but Schwab, among other things, says this. He says, and this was mind blowing, given again my uh, my uh, uh, advanced chemistry student of the year from my junior year of uh, high school, uh, Schwab says that if life had a chemical beginning, then there's no way that it had a single origin. It would have, it, life would have began at the molar scale. The molar scale is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd, which is the scale at which chemical reactions emerge. Well, if Lane, if Lane is going to say that that the the chemistry that, that that involved is so ubiquitous that it could happen not just on early Earth, primordial Earth, but anywhere else in the in the uh, in the cosmos where these conditions arise, then why wouldn't it have happened multiple places on Earth simultaneously? And so this view from from a this this naturalistic chemical origin account places diversity as an initial condition, not something that emerges. Over time, one of the things that Del Ratch said is that uh, Del Ratch, Christian philosophy science guy, um, one of the things that Del Ratch said was that um, he says, uh, you know, a lot of people misperceive Darwinism as a theory of uh, similarity. It's not a theory of similarity; it's a theory of change. I thought, okay, yeah, fair enough, fair enough, right? But um, if you ask a Darwinist what their evidence is for evolution, that it's this theory of change. They're going to point to similarities. I, I saw this little clip from uh, uh, UC Cal Berkeley. A student was asking Richard Dawkins this question. Uh, Professor Dawkins, if you could, in one sentence, dissuade someone from believing in God, how would you do it? And Dawkins, you know, with that nice, refined British accent that I find so irritating in how much I like it. Like, I like what you're, I like how you're saying these things, but I despise what you're saying. You know, that kind of ambivalence. Um, Dawkins says that I would basically, I would point, I'm not going to do the voice, but uh, I would point out 
that these similarities uh, at the anatomical level down to the genetic level, the similarities of all all living things, these living systems. And you go, why would a why would an intelligent designer do that? An intelligent creator do that? Okay. Now let's leave Dawkins aside, but it's this. If Schwab is right, and Schwab is not a not a Christian, uh, uh, despite his name being Christian, um, he's a he's a naturalistic chemist. He's he's just frustrated that people will affirm on the one hand, and Dawkins does this uh, somewhere in Blind Watch Mary, he affirms that the origin of life study is a study of chemistry. Well, Schwab, as a chemist, is going okay. Do you understand what the implications of that are? The implications are that Darwinism that started with the, you know, back in the 18, uh, 1859 started with a single cell because that was the basic unit of biology back then. And he, he has to start with a singularity, a biological singularity, a single cell, and then diversify life from there. Schwab goes, no, if, uh, if life has a chemical origin, then, then, um, uh, diversity is an initial condition. If that's true, then all of these, all of these elements of similarity, comparative anatomy, ge ge genomic or genetic similarities, could have nothing to do with one another, right? And and, and the evidence for that, or the or the the import of that is, look at the way that uh, somebody like an uh, Ernst Mayer will deploy the idea of convergent evolution, right? Here you have um, a cephalopod, like a giant squid, who has an eye that's remarkably similar to the human eye. In the way it's able to whatever uh whatever eyes do uh, i'm leaving my biology aside here but we know we know that there is uh, on on other evidence that that they had com they're they're almost completely genealogically unrelated to one another which means that the cephalopods eye and the human eye emerged along different gene genealogical lines so there is a similarity that has nothing to do with genealogy well what what we're saying here is that given this chemical view of the origin of life that might be true for every living system plants animals you know so so that when the darwinist starts to go well this is really similar to that Th this bone looks like that bone you go yeah so what you, your yeah. similar you, your similarities are based on a 165 year old theory and what if we just what if we don't have those assumptions at all? Yeah. Then we have a non-genealogical view of the fossil record. Punctuated equilibrium comes back to the fore because we now we actually take account of the fact that. So then, so so where things are going is this. Um, I've got uh, Pigliucci and Mueller's uh, extended evolutionary synthesis, uh, and what I say in the book is that this is not an extension at all. These are the uh, phenotypic plas plasticity, metamorphosis. Uh, uh, dormancy and then and then germination, things like that. Um, uh, epigenetics, right? These all fit under a uh, under a completely post Darwinian view. And and it's vestigial, if you'll pardon the pun. It's vestigial to try and make them fit in with a kind of nineteenth century gradualism. It's just that none of that stuff fits. But the explanation of the explanation is why hasn't anybody noticed this? Because scientists, by their training and their disposition, are realists. No scientist yeah. goes in the lab and goes, "Well, what I'm what I'm what I'm working on isn't literally true." So, by disposition, they're realists, and and realists think that the way in which to overturn a paradigm is by more evidence. Yeah. So, that's, so if I could interject, I, I want to yeah, get Andrew absolutely. in here. Um, but yeah, so the point is well taken and well made in the book that up until this point, it seems like. ID proponents have been, have been just lodging criticisms That's at right. the Darwinian paradigm. But what you argue for in the book is that really what we need to do is we need to we need to offer a different paradigm that better accounts for some of these anomalies that that have been popping up over the last several decades. So I think the point is really well made. But at this point, Andrew, I want to bring you in on the conversation. What are your thoughts, questions? Um, well, I don't know what phenotypic plasticity means uh, when when when, <laughs> okay. when when yeah science isn't exactly uh, isn't exactly my background but when people start using terms like that i just usually remind them that i'm a doctor trust me yeah. no but um in all seriousness though uh, there's a there's a lot of 
I, I guess sort of building off of what I just said, uh, with more of a philosophical than scientific background, um, the first half of the book was particularly my favorite part of this because it's dealing with all that me- methodological uh all those methodological concerns. Mm-hmm. And there's a number of charts in there uh, that I think are, are just really, I mean, they alone are worth the price of the book. <laughs> and a number of those charts are, um, are ones, I don't know if it'll, hopefully it'll show up on the screen, but you've got like the, uh, you've got like oh, the yeah. pyramid, pyramid of the assumptions. Pyramid yeah. Um, yeah. And one of the things that jumped out to me about this, and I imagine you've probably heard this question quite a lot. Uh, and that is that, you know, around the time that Darwin's writing, there's a big, debate over what's going to be what we'll call first philosophy, kind of like the grounding science of all sciences, right? What's going to be truly first philosophy. And, you know, Marx is going to come along and say, oh, it's the science of economics, right? You're going to have somebody like Darwin come along and say more like biology, or at least. Um, I was going to say sociology or something like that. Right. And so in your your pyramid, you have at the base metaphysics, which Mm -hmm. is a very classical answer, right? And, and you address, of course, the, the response to Descartes, which is that Descartes comes along and I don't think he's quite aware that he's doing this because mm-hmm. epistemology doesn't exist yet. He's kind of bringing it into being. That's right. right? But um, but so what Descartes kind of effectively does is swaps out the metaphysics with epistemology. And it seems like most of the modernist ways of thinking have really been aiming at first philosophy still is addressed at some kind of, a, of epistemology here. Mm. Right. And so, uh, in a sense, for your pyramid there, right, like epistemology is midway through the pyramid, right? It goes metaphysics, yeah. anthropology, epistemology, philosophy of science, then science. Yeah. Right? Well, so the thing about this sort of alternative take that I think a lot of the contemporary scientists are going to probably by default hold to if they hold to any sort of self-aware philosophical point. Yeah is it's less that they're going to be just presuming materialism because that's metaphysics, that metaphysics isn't first philosophy. Yeah. Right. They're going to be starting off in the epistemological realm. And that's, and so you see something like, again, um, the kind of anti-science that's been popping up from the left, particularly uh, with sort of um, uh, the kind of criticisms of, you know, science being uh, rooted in some sort of oppressive system kind of argument. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, that's because first philosophy for them is going to be, you know, something more sociologically rooted, something more, you know, economically rooted, something like that. Yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, And so the big question that I'm sure you get all the time is, well, yeah, but science started around the time of Descartes. I mean, several of the Mm. intros to the philosophy of science are, you know, uh, that I've got, we'll say it begins with Descartes, Newton, and basically those proto-enlightenment and enlightenment figures. Mm -hmm. Uh, and all of them were trying to figure out first philosophy as some form of epistemology here. Mm-hmm. And what you're now proposing is that we go back to that unscientific age of the medievals, right? That you go yeah. all the way back there and you uh, and you want us to you want us to go back to that time when they didn't even know what by your own admission. They didn't even have philosophy of science back then. You want us mm-hmm. to go back then. And uh, how is that not just going to be a non-starter? How would that not just take us right back to the dark ages? <laughs> Good. Well, I I didn't expect that level of uh, <clears throat> pushback, but I appreciate it. I'm this just is, I, good te- I, I yeah, agree with you entirely. Testament. I just want to throw that out. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> no, it's good. De- Devil's advocate. Yeah. I can see your horns. Um, <laughs> um Doctor Payne here. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, like Anthony's uh, twin brother, right? <laughs> uh, yeah. So w- what I would say is is this. Uh, so. One one of the ways to look at philosophical theses is given their theoretical virtues. And one of those theoretical virtues is explanatory scope, depth, power, things like that. So the, the first thing I would say is that I, I at least was aware enough of this break with modernity to give an account of um, why... Descartes' break with Aquinas was mistaken, right? Um, and I, I think it starts with given that given that the pyramid that you you showed, uh, De, one of Descartes' problems is that he divorces, um, he he does havoc with our philosophical anthropology. He he thinks of himself as a as a a, a mind in matter, right? So he he thinks of mind as immaterial and unextended and then matter as material and extended 
And then this is where you have the famous interaction problem of substance dualism. You have an immaterial mind in a material body. Like how did, well, the, the pineal gland <laughs> was uh, Descartes' uh, response. So uh, just, just from, a, uh, from a purely philosophical perspective, I would say, look at, um, look at the ways in which a modern approach to philosophical reasoning ends in insoluble dichotomies as an evidence that something went wrong. The, the second thing is, is that I would say that if, if that's, if that's fair, that man is one unified knowing subject, then what Wilhelmsen talks about, uh, Frederick Wilhelmsen is uh, uh, one of the other uh, authors on Thomas epistemology that I find uh, clear. And one of the things that he says on page one of his man's knowledge of reality is that epistemology, you're right, uh, doesn't exist in the medieval era because for Aquinas, epistemology emerges as this nexus between, between the knower and the thing known, right? And so... Um, what Aquinas recaptures for us is a, the nature of the knower and the nature of the thing known. And if you look at the fruit of what the analysis bears, this, this continuity is right. Um, and you, and you say the, the effects are, are indicative of the, uh, of the theory itself. You go, okay, well this, this, this gives us some clear direction to navigate all of these dichotomies and to solve a lot of these problems. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that fruitful isn't that uh admirable so that so it has these the the theory has some of these virtues and going back to um aren't we dragging things back into the medieval era where they didn't have science at all yeah that's that's actually a, a great clarifying question because Gilson deals with that in his methodical realism he says he says uh look Aristotelian Thomism, as it stri as it tried to deal with things like, uh, you know, human conception and uh, the the nature of stars as intelligible substances and whatever, right, you know, like st stars and planets uh, go along their pathward in intelligently because they were they they mean to do those things or something like that. Um, uh, Gilson says very plainly, he goes, yeah, all that all that is trash. It failed and it should have failed. Because it's false. But none of that, none of that touches the underlying metaphysics of it. And 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 uh going back to um as I as we wince and I say Alvin planting as uh uh proper functionalism, uh planting actually points out that you know um you can't have you can't have a Darwinian or a or a modernistic Darwinian account of mind because it undercuts itself. Right. You, so, so in terms of like a broad Christian, so ultimately going back to this, you know, idea of, uh, philosophy serving theology and having an apologetic end, I would say this, that this kind of philosophy of science, keep in mind this, this is, I think, conversant with the way philosophers of science are talking about the philosophy of science. This, this isn't a, just sort of a way of shoehorning Thomism into, no, the, I, I, Look, if there's a if there's a principal distinction that I've missed, then 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 fine. I'm I'm open to correction. But to the best of my ability, I think this is a natural extension of of uh, it, it it pulls in elements of uh, disparate philosophers of science themselves that are that are grappling with things. And actually I'll I'll do this. I, I was gonna try and make it through without doing this, but um this is uh Drew, how do you say this guy's name? Sir Talange. Okay, okay. I thought it was I got something that else. entirely from you. Yeah. Well, I, I had heard that you, you, his name is pronounced otherwise, and I, I didn't know. Okay. Well, if so, it is, I, I heard it from you. So I'm okay. Yeah. So, <laughs> so we'll all just uh, yeah. remember remember Canassus. Yeah. Yeah. Right. We, we said Nassus forever until he got on uh, Matthew Cote's dissertation, and he's like, "No, it, you pronounce the K." We're like, "Oh shoot!" That was a, <laughs> that was a bit of a shift for all of us. So, um, so I was reading uh, the Intellectual Life this summer and uh, came across this quotation, and it was extremely gratifying okay so just patting myself on the back and and just giving more clarity here circle says this other systems are opposed 
to adjacent systems. So, so they're say system A and system B, they're opposed to one another because they're adjacent. They're they're right next to each other. So one flaw, so think realism, anti-realism, think um, you know, um uh materialism versus substantialism in the philosophy of mind. These two systems that are adjacent to one another about the same subject, they they're they're opposed. So other systems are opposed to adjacent systems. Thomism reconciles them in a higher light, taking account of what led them into error, careful to be just to all that is right in them. Other systems have been contradicted by facts. Thomism goes to meet facts, envelops them, interprets them, classifies them, and establishes them, as it were, by legal right. So, so as I was, I was as I was reading Search Lounge this summer, I thought, Search Lounge says what I sort of backed into methodologically, and that is this: when I was studying the intelligent design Darwinism debate, I realized that that the resolution between these two competing paradigms had to be done at the level of the philosophy of science, which is what Search Lounge is saying. You have to go to another level of abstraction. Well, when I got to that level of abstraction in the philosophy of science, I found a realism anti-realism debate that itself needed resolution, right? So I went to a higher level of abstraction to epistemology. Okay, well, how is it that humans know, right? And then I tried to establish in a principled way that Aquinas' view of how humans know is distinctly and I think superiorly different than Descartes, which is what started the modernity project the experiment. Given that we can have this kind of resolution of the dichotomy in the philosophy of science, and given that resolution, we can have this kind of resolution of the intelligent design neo-Darwinism debate. Right. So, th so that I mean, if people are interested in that kind of, but I, I guess my point is this. As the as the book was going through its like sixth or eighth round of edits and typesetting and all that stuff, I, I needed a break from this. So I'm start, I'm reading Search Launch, and Search Launch is basically explaining what Thomism can do if used properly. And I'm seeing accidentally that that's how I used it in this particular debate. And so I was just again, you know, Search Launch is writing this stuff in the 1930s. And so to, to discover that I sort of accidentally applied Thomism in a methodologically consistent way was, it was gratifying. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. And I would say that, you know, regardless of what one thinks of the Thomistic epistemology, your, your main arguments still go through. I mean, there yeah. is this thing called epistemic structural realism that's out there, and you're just trying to give kind of a philosophical backing to yeah. this view in the philosophy of science that's already out there. And uh, that's all you really need to do the kind of analysis that you do in terms of the debate between the neo-Darwinist and the ID proponent. So even if yeah. one ultimately rejects the Thomistic epistemology, I think so many of your criticisms in the book still go through. Either yeah. way, um, especially when it comes to the higher level criticisms about, you know, uh, talking at the level of paradigm rather at, than at the level of one's metaphysical commitments. Mm -hmm. Could, could yeah. I add one yeah. more thing to that? Yeah, go ahead, Drew. Um, that one of the things I think is most sort of exciting and revolutionary in what you're proposing is precisely the addition of eclecticism to mm. this. And that eclecticism, I think, I'm, I'm wondering and this is sort of the part two of the question I just asked you, is that even possible apart from actually something like what a, this Thomistic notion of, of reason is going to be like? Mm -hmm. Because what Descartes is introducing, you never really can get away from metaphysics. Jill Sloan makes this point very well in a couple yeah. of books. Um, but the thing is, you never really can get away from metaphysics. It's always going to at least be present in a sort of you know, behind the scenes kind sort of, of way. implicit way. Sure. Right. And so what happens for the modernist paradigm is when you swap out metaphysics and put epistemology at the base, mm -hmm. all of a sudden this new metaphysical entity emerges called reason. Right. Oh, I see. Yeah. And so, <laughs> the, and reason therefore has a nature and that nature is what we're trying to unpack when we know the thing. Yeah. Right? And so that the reality of the Thomistic position is to say, there is no such thing as reason. There's reason. Yeah. Right? That's right. And so in reasoning, we now have the opportunity to actually approximate our understanding to the precise type of object in the precise type of science. Yeah. And that links us to something. Uh, uh, it's it's actually not in one of Aristotle's more uh, 
scientific works in the contemporary sense of the term, it's actually in the Nicomachean Ethics in the opening yeah. where he, he writes that yeah. in the same spirit, therefore, each type of statement be received for it is the mark of an educated man to look for precision for precision in each class of the thing, just so far as the nature of the subject admits. It is evidently equally foolish to accept probable reasoning from a mathematician and to demand from a rhetorician scientific proofs. That's right. right? There's a scientific eclecticism that Aristotle is pointing to right mm -hmm. there. And what I find to be particularly interesting about that as well, to kind of further that, that part two of the question, is that if anything, postmodernism, I think, can almost be understood as a rejection of that metaphysical object of reason, mm. right? And so it's breaking it back apart. And that seems to be the trend in thought. Now, a lot of like elements of that keep showing up in different scientific theories and so forth. But the fact of the matter is that sort of the idea of reason has been shattered in and of itself. Mm. But we're in this void, if you will, of not knowing what to replace it with. And that's sort of where you're coming along and saying, hey, scientific eclecticism based off of this this approach not to reason, but to reasoning, the activity of the knower and the thing known. So I didn't know if that's something you would care to comment on. Too. Yeah, no. So, so uh, yeah, reason be, being the power, but knowledge being the object, right? Um, so, at, so for example, uh, uh, Lawrence Bonjour at the beginning of his book on uh, his second edition on epistemology, he'll say, he'll say, uh, epistemology is the study of knowledge right? We're studying knowledge. And then we have to ask, you know, how do we, but there are all these instances of knowledge, mathematical, historical, aesthetic, whatever, right? How are all of these knowledge? And then the question is, uh, do animals have knowledge? Do angels have knowledge? Does God have knowledge, right? So knowledge becomes this univocal concept that is binary. We either have it or we don't, right? And so this uh this methodical realism this this aristotelian thomistic approach goes no there there isn't th th that's a it's a fallacy of modernity to say that there is this thing called knowledge in in because uh what is true in, and this is what joseon says is that there are knowledges right and 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 drew going back to the the nicomachean ethics you go um nobody says nobody says you know uh uh you know, how, how should I be a good father today? Well, let me get my calculator out and do the math. Nobody does that because this sort of moral reasoning that we go through is qualitative, not quantitative, right? Because the virtues are qualitative, not quantitative. And so what, what Aristotle is pointing out is that you, you don't look for quantitative precision in moral reasoning because it's a category mistake. Extend that into the 21st century. And, and apply that to, you know, uh, whales versus orcs. And you have the same, you have a similar concept. We don't look for, we don't look for, uh, for precision eight to nine places past the decimal point in terms of, um, how whales migrate. Cause that's just a, it's a category mistake. These are the, the now the migration of whales is something that should be known by, by its proper science. But in those proper ways that are that are um, that are consistent with the nature of the object, right? Yeah, yeah, those are all great points. Um, so many more things that you bring up in this, but you really do cover a lot of a lot of things in a very short book, relatively short book, um, from epistemology to the philosophy of science to the intricacies of some of the details of uh, the debate between neo Darwinism and and um, intelligent design. You also do a nice survey of some of the anomalies that mm. are currently standouts within the um, Darwinian paradigm. So just so much in this book that we could talk about. We might have to do a part two, um, mm. but we're coming up on a couple hours. So I think this is a good place here to wrap it up. Yeah. Um, JT, thanks again for coming on. And again, congratulations on this book. Uh, really enjoyed it. Um, once more, the book's called Beyond Origin, a post-Darwinian design theory. And for those interested in getting a copy, I'll put an, a link uh, to the Amazon page where you can buy the book in, in the description of this video.